This is Paul Schmid. Welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Federico Cabrera is cycling thousands of miles through developing countries with a portable photography studio. His goal is to meet families in need that don't have a family portrait and to make one for them. The project is called Their Only Portrait, and his plan is to visit a new country every year, starting with his home country of Argentina. He has already cycled over 3,000 miles along the Cordillera de los Andes and has several thousand more to go. You can learn more about his project at theironlyportrait.com. Federico Cabrera, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Thank you very much, Paul. Federico, what inspired you to start this project? Well, a few years back, after a small fire at home, I realized digital and printed photos are the second most valuable thing I have at home, after my family, which includes my dogs, obviously. After spending some time exploring and meeting local people at developing countries, I found out some people don't even have one single image of their own family. And as a photographer, I knew I could make a difference for some of them. How did you become a photographer? Well, as a child, I dreamed of exploring Africa as a national geographic photographer. But I ended up studying and having a successful career in foreign trade instead. And a few years later, I decided to go to photography school just for pleasure. And then I spent all my free time making photos. I read through your website and part of your biography, and it says that in 2011, you quit your job in foreign trade to take some time to cycle in Patagonia and uh, photograph the area. Um, Tell me about that. Yeah. I liked my job and I was working at a pretty good company, but it didn't really make me happy. And I realized that if there was a slight chance of living doing something that I love, I should try it. And if it didn't work out, I could go back to the office later. So I sent my resignation, loaded a truck with my camping gear, my bicycle, and I headed to Patagonia. I did the big trip by truck, but then started exploring the small places by bicycle. Can I ask a question about your truck? Sure. Do you still have it? No. I couldn't afford it anymore after I quit foreign trade. It was a Land Rover Defender, and it is quite expensive to to take care of it with my struggling photography business. That was a nice truck. Uh, I don't see many trucks like that here in the United States. No, but here in Patagonia, they are quite common. They are really, really expensive here, and spare parts are hard to find. So after I quit my big job in the office, I decided it was a good idea to get rid of it, uh, just in case. And I don't know. I I, I don't need that that much. Now I I cycle everywhere, and it's better for me this way. So before you started on this this photography um, adventure that you you have from their only portrait, you had to put together a photography studio and then you had to go out and do some test rides to to test this out. Um, What did you learn? How how did those test rides go and what did you learn about your photography equipment? The thing is to test myself and my gear, I did two warm-up trips. One to try the three most toughest climbs in Argentina, Aura de Punta Corral, Serranía del Hornocal, Cuesta de Lipán. I had been at high altitude before, over 12,000 foot, but never riding a bicycle. So I thought that if we, my, my gear and I were able to survive this trip, flatter surface should be a walk in the park. The other warm-up trip was made at one of Argentina's wildest and more remote areas. It's called Inimpenetrable. It's pretty flat, but it has extreme heat up to 122 Fahrenheit. And in theory, with dust and bugs, and it was annoying. So those two warm-up trips covered, I thought I could handle the bigger trip. 
And regarding the photography studio, I started working in photography in 2011. And the project started two years ago, so I have a few years in between to get used to photography gear and setting up a studio and everything related to photography. Have you had any problems with any of your photography equipment? Uh, yeah, I did. Uh, there are a few things that, that failed during the trip. It's a long story, but I started my warm-up trips with a full-frame digital SLR on a mirrorless camera as a backup. Plus, a portable photography studio flash with its battery pack and a small speed light as backup. After the first warm-up trip, I had to sell one of the cameras because I was running with a tout budget and I need to upgrade some essential gear for the trip. So I decided to sell the big DSLR and just stick with the mirrorless camera. And during the warm -up, second warm-up trip, I realized I made the right choice because the local people I was making images for were less intimidated by the smaller camera. But in that trip, the studio flash battery pack, it failed and it burned the studio flash. Then I left for the main trip with a small mirrorless camera and a small speed light because I didn't have the budget to replace the big broken portable studio flash. And after a month and a half at South Patagonia stuff environment, the small mirrorless camera died. As I didn't have enough budget to replace it, I started a crowdfunding campaign. And thanks to GoFundMe and 21 awesome people, I was able to replace the broken camera and get back on the road. So photography gear, I broke one camera, a studio flash, and a battery pack so far. It doesn't seem like much, but with my budget, it's a lot, actually. And today I'm just using a small Fushimi film X100T, two small speed lights, plus a pocket photo printer, two tripods, two octoboxes, two hard drives, a tablet, a photometer, and I think a couple of filters. And that's uh, my current photography equipment on this project. What about the printer? How How is the printer held up? Actually, the printer is had like a year on the road and it's perfect. It doesn't, it looks like new. Fortunately, it, it, it never failed. It's a really cheap printer. So if it did fail, it was not such a big deal. But so far, it's holding up pretty good, actually. Federico, tell me a little bit about your bike that you ride on. And it sounds like you're carrying quite a bit of equipment how do you uh, i've seen the photographs of your bike yeah here. the thing is after my warm-up trips it was clear that the wear gear i was using wasn't up to the task and i started analyzing the best options available on the market even when i know it's possible to travel with any bike and bags having the right tool for the job makes things easier especially i'm when i, I i'm riding off the beaten track usually you took, I think, a bicycle uh, mechanic certification. Uh, was that worth it, and what did you learn from that? Yeah, I basically learned to take care of my bike and to fix it if something fails a few hundred miles from the next bike shop. So far, my steed was flawless, but I'm planning to ride 5,000 miles along the Cordillera de los Andes with only 5% of it on paved roads. So I think the new skills might get handy one of these days. You started in Ushuaia, and how did you get down there? Actually, I officially started at Cabo Virgenes, Rio Gallegos. That's route 40 kilometers zero. That's for my 40th birthday. But unofficially, I took a train from home to southern Buenos Aires just to get away from the big city. And I started cycling along the Atlantic shore through Ruta 3 to Rio Gallegos. I think I hitchhiked the last kilometers. And from there, from Cabo Virgen is the, is the little tip of Argentina. I cycled all the way down to Ushuaia and then I started heading up. 
What are the conditions of the, the road? Are you cycling on roads? Or are you cycling on trails? What, what are the conditions? Well, so far, most of the trip was done on paved roads or very good gravel roads. The only exception is Peninsula Mitre, where there was no trails and I was riding through the beach when there was low tides or through bedlands the rest of the time. And now when I'm going back on the road in a few weeks, this time I will try to hold as much pavement as possible. But I will say that most of the time is is gravel roads what I'm cycling. There is some single track, but most of it is, is, is gravel. Are you mostly camping outside or when you meet these people that you're doing a, f- a portrait for, do they bring you in and let you stay in their house? Uh, I'm usually invited to sleep at people's house, but I'm so used to sleeping at my tent that I usually prefer to lay my tent in their gardens or backyards. Only if the weather is really, really intolerable, I, I will sleep at somebody's house. What is the reaction of the people that you meet to your project? What do they say? It's difficult, but what I usually do is I stop to ask for direction of waters when I see any local. Even if I don't need any water or direction, I just stop with excuse to to start a conversation. Or if it's getting dark, I ask for a place to lay my tent. And they're usually really interested to know why I'm cycling alone, because it's not common in Argentina for people to travel alone. And I'm cycling that's not come on here either especially to the places where i go and they're always asking where i'm coming from where i'm going so before they hear about my project we already started a conversation at least i asked them if they have any photos of their family to show them when i asked me i always tell them i'm too young to have kids and i almost almost four i am 40 years old actually and by this time of the conversation, I already know how many kids I have. Most of the people are younger than me, and they already have kids. Some of them have grandkids. So if they tell me that they don't have any photo to show me, I tell them that I'm a photographer, and that it would be a pleasure for me to make their photos and print them. So it's like, like they give me water, and as I'm a photographer, I give them a photo for free, just because I, I would love to do it. And they are usually really happy with that, but it usually takes like three or four times for me to explain them that the photo is for free, that I give them for them just for pleasure, because they are not used to getting much from other people, and they don't even have one photo, and for them, having one photo of the kids is priceless. So as they are usually really humble people, they want to make sure it's for free. Do you have a daily routine? Well, actually, I don't. It, it, it mainly depends where I'm cycling at, how much food or water do I have with me until the next time I, I will be able to resupply, and the chances I have to meet locals to make the portraits. So I, mainly every day is different because I don't have a tight schedule. I, I hit the road uh, and I go wherever the road takes me. What has been the most challenging part so far? Yeah, I think that the most challenging was riding really, really huge distances at Patagonia with really bad weather and without being able to meet any local families along the way. I don't mind traveling solo, but I was hoping to make more portraits by now. And southern Patagonia was days and days cycling with, without any people around. Do you have a... a- a set goal, a set target number for the amount of portraits you want to make for this project? At first, I was hoping to do a thousand portraits, but so far I made less than a hundred. And mainly that's the reason why I I ended my trip at Southern Patagonia because of the winter. And instead of going back to Patagonia to start cycling, I'm going north and then I will cycle all the way down to Patagonia where I left last autumn, because most of the por- portraits will be made at not the people usually live in small houses in the middle of the countryside. So I'm hoping to make a thousand portraits, and now that I'm heading to northern Argentina, I will be making portraits every single day for sure. What has been the most fun for you so far? 
I think the most fun part was to watch the kids as they watched their print photo came out of the printer. My small device prints one color at a time. So first the print gets all yellow, then it gets inside again, gets a red ink, comes again. So it takes like a minute to print the photo. And to watch the kids stare at the printer while they get their photo was awesome. One of the things that you were able to do was you went to a Bicycle Expo 2015. What was your experience at that event talking about your project? It was really good to be able to speak face-to-face with the audience and mainly to show the gear I was taking for my trip because here in Argentina, bikepacking is not developed yet. So uh, most of the people was the first bikepacking setup they saw. Um, it was really good to show them that people can travel lighter. Most cyclists touring here in Argentina, they carry like 100 liters of luggage in their bicycles with four panniers and bags. So show that it's easier to travel lighter was a good thing also. One of the things that you want to do in the next part of your trip is to begin giving away water filters, and solar lights. So I have two questions. One is why, and the second one is how will you carry all of this on your bike? Okay. The why question is because during my second warm-up trip, I saw it was priceless for the parents to have at least one printed photo of their kids. But unfortunately, I found out that most people had more more important things missing. Most of the people didn't have electricity, they didn't have clean water, so they cut trees in the forest just to boil their water and to light their houses. And other people just drink contaminated water without any treatment at all. So as soon as I arrived home after that trip, I started searching for portable water filters and lights to give away to the families that needed it most in my next trip. I was fortunate enough to get response from Empower. It's a small company in the States. and They produce a small inflatable solar light that is called Lucy. and It charges in three hours of sunlight and it gives four hours of light for a four by four room. Um, that's inflatable light, it only weighs two ounces. So I'm able to carry at least 10 of those every time I hit the road. And I get more of those at home. And as soon as I need them, they ship them to whatever location I'm cycling at. And the water filters is the same. For my next trip, I will be carrying water filters to give away to the families that need them most. And I will be given clean water to 20 families for a decade. And those water filters weigh 10 ounces. So between the water filters and the solar lights, I'm not carrying more weight or volume than with a portable studio. So, yeah, I actually carry some of the gear with me and get more at home. And whenever I need it, I get shipments by bus, by courier, whatever and I deliver it to the people I meet along the road. How about for yourself? Um, I'm thinking about your food and your the supplies you need to survive. Do you purchase them along the way, or do you also get them shipped to you? No, I, I purchase along the way. I usually carry food for at least with me all the time for three, four days. Sometimes, depending on the stretch, I'm going to head for a week. Usually, I carry like luxuries. I carry good coffee, I'm carrying honey, I'm carrying fruits and vegetables, spices that I'm not able to find. Most of the time i able to find noodles and rice and pasta, even if the village is really, really small. Basic stuff like mashed potatoes and tomato sauce, you can find it almost everywhere, bread. So I usually carry the things that I might not be able to find in small places, and the rest of the gear I buy it along the road. When are you setting off again? 
I think by the end of a month, I'm waiting for a shipment of gear from the United States. Um, door to door services are not working okay here in Argentina yet because they used to be frozen for a while. Now they start working again, but they are not working properly. So I'm waiting for that gear to arrive to Buenos Aires. And as soon as I get it, I, I will hit the road. I think by the end of September, probably. Uh, what gear are you waiting for? I'm waiting for more water filters, more solar lights, uh, merino base layers, cycling shoes, two bicycle tires. There are not really huge or important things, but there are things that they are not easy to find down here in Argentina. So I usually buy it abroad and wait till somebody flies down here to bring it to me. You mentioned that you were doing some um, online fundraising, some crowdfunding. Um, how is that going? Are you still doing it? And how, if people want to be involved in your project, how do they how do they uh, donate funds to your cause? Yeah, I, I did a crowdfunding project with my camera broke and I didn't have a backup. That campaign was successful. I was able to raise the money and get the new camera. And now I started a new campaign to get funds to buy more water filters and to cover some of the expenses of the trip because I returned home to Buenos Aires for the winter and to make some money to, to get back on the road. But I have an accident instead and I couldn't do any work for three months. So my budget was pretty tight and I decided to make a crowdfunding campaign just in case somebody wants to, to help a little bit with this project. Uh, the crowdfunding is with GoFundMe, and the project is the only portrait too. The only portrait was the one to buy the the broken camera that that was successful, and I not receiving funds anymore there because the camera it's already bought. So now it's the only portrait too, and that's uh, the crowdfunding campaign that I'm using now to get more water filters and cover some of the expenses of the street. So that's gofundme.com slash their only portrait two. That's right. And if you go to my project's website, theonlyportrait.com, you have like a bar to make donations and that will open the current GoFundMe campaign. And there are also options for donations with a PayPal account. But uh, mainly I get funds through PayPal and so we all found it. GoFundMe was more successful because uh, I got a lot of support from GoFundMe itself that covered half of my campaign. So that was awesome. I wanted to ask you about some of the other things that I read about in your biography. Uh, yep. It said that you were at one time, and maybe you still are, a beekeeper. How did you get involved in beekeeping? More than a decade ago, I saw everything. I used to live in the city. I sold everything I had and moved to the countryside. Uh, and I decided it would be cool to have one hive to get like organic honey for my family and my friends. And I started beekeeping just to, to get my, my bees healthy and everything. And found it really interesting. So from one hive, I made two the next year. And from those two, I made four the following, and I start duplicating my comps till I got 50. And I think 15 is the biggest amount I, I could keep to take it care of with one person, just myself without any support. So, so far, I have 50 comps or hives. Um, part of that honey is what supports my project too, beside my, my photography work. So far, like 90% of my project is self-funded. How far outside of Buenos Aires do you live? No, it's only 50 kilometers, but it's where the countryside starts. I'm 50 kilometers from the city, one block from the highway, so it's really easy to get to the city, but I'm still in the countryside, everything is green, trees, birds. It's a different environment. Yeah. Uh, your biography also said that you were in the World Barista Championship in Tokyo. 
how, how did you get involved in that? And, and what was the outcome? Did you win a prize? Uh, well, I always liked coffee, but it wasn't until that I started dating a girl after college whose mother was Colombian that I really discovered real coffee because coffee in Argentina is usually not good. And I flew to Colombia a couple of times, tried different coffees from there, and I got really hooked with coffee, and it, it became one of my hobbies at that time. And I started learning until I ended up being the first non-professional barista at the World Cup 2009 in Tokyo. I was Argentina's first competitor also. But the thing about it is that I arrived to Tokyo, and my luggage was lost. I flew there by myself. I arrived to a foreign country without knowing a single word in Japanese. Uh, and not everybody speaks English, at least back then, as I thought. So it was not that easy to handle by myself. And I was there without any luggage, without any gear for four days. And all my gear arrived only 10 minutes before the competition time. And unfortunately, I was disqualified because I exceeded my time, because I didn't have any time to practice there. But it was an awesome experience. I met some of the best baristas in the world and were still friends. So it was an awesome experience. And I didn't have any chances to win at all, but it was just for the experience. Also, your biography says that you live with seven stray dogs. Is that true? Yes, they used to be, they always fluctuate. The most I had was 10, but some of them were old and they passed away so far. Unfortunately, it's common in the city that parents buy puppies for their kids, but when the puppies get bigger and become an inconvenient in a small apartment, it's easier for them to release them to their lack in the countryside. Uh, and a dog who was raised in an apartment cannot survive in the countryside by themselves because they don't know how to hunt, to find water. So I usually find dogs that they are starving, and I took them in, feed them, try to get it in shape to find their home. But usually the ugly ones stay here. People don't usually like old or ugly dogs, so those end up here. And If you have a couple of dogs, to have one more is not such a big inconvenience. So that's the thing. I started adding dogs till I get 10, and now I still got seven. Where do they live? Do they live? Do you have a house for them outside? Yeah, only one lives in, inside. The rest, they have small houses outside, and I have a big property, so uh, they have enough space to run to do whatever they want. So it's just buying more food. It's not such a big thing to have more dogs. Federico, what's next for you and their only portrait project? Well, as I told you, in a few weeks, I'm planning to northern Argentina, and I'm going to cycle all the way down to Patagonia, 5,000 miles with only 5% on paved roads. And if I'm able to get enough funds, next year I will take my little personal project to Bolivia to make exactly the same thing I'm doing here in Argentina in Bolivia. Is your plan to only travel to the countries in South America? No, actually I'm planning to go to India and probably Kenya. But so far logistics are way easier here in South America. Bolivia is just next door to Argentina. So until I'm able to be a little more experienced with the project, I prefer to keep it local. And my budget is really tight right now. So buying a flight to India is the same money to do the same the whole project in Bolivia. So for now, I'm heading to Bolivia because it's an amazing place to do the project. And it's also one of the cheapest places around. So, Federico, let's tell people one more time. How, how can they find out more about um, this project that you're doing? And how can they um, donate to your cause if they want to? Uh, they can find more information at the project's website, theironlyportrait.com. There you have the option to go to GoFundMe or to PayPal for make donations. And then on social media, 
Facebook, Instagram, Twitter as their only portrait. Federico Cabrera, thank you so much for coming on the show. And one more time, it's, um, your project is called Their Only Portrait, and it's at theironlyportrait.com. A good luck and continued success. Thank you very much to you, Paul, to give me the opportunity to be here. It was a pleasure to speak a little bit about my project. Um, thank you again. You're welcome. Recorded September 14th, 2016. For more great podcasts, visit thepursuitzone.com. Thank you.